I've been asked to explain the scientific reasons why a person might have a favorable memory of a social interaction at the time of the event or a week or a year later, still having a favorable view of it, but then two decades later has a negative view and a different memory of the same social interaction. Let me first focus on the area of research that I think is most relevant, memory of emotions and emotions themselves, and then I'll transition to other relevant research. And I'll show you some of my research and the research of others as well. First, there is research that shows that if you reappraise an event or a person in the past, you come to feel different emotions towards that event or that person, but you also come to remember how you felt at the time differently too. And this idea that reappraisals can lead to changes in memory of emotion has been shown in longitudinal studies and in some experimental studies too. So what do I mean by reappraise here? I mean to reevaluate a situation or a past situation and the people within that situation according to our needs and our wants. Cognitive appraisals of a situation and of the people within that situation and their intentions are what cause an emotion. It's an evaluation of the situation according to our wants, our needs and our desires and how we perceive that situation and the people within it causes an emotion. For example, if we appraise a situation where we think that somebody is deliberately blocking one of our goals or one of our desires, we might feel something akin to rage. However, if we appraise that perception a bit differently and we think that the person is unintentionally blocking what we want, then we might feel a different emotion, such as frustration or something like that. So in other words, our perceptions are really important in forming the emotion. So a key aspect of this is that our emotions are caused by our own appraisals of the situation. They are not always caused by others. Let's take another example. If you appraise yourself as having thoughts or behaviors that are wrong, then you may feel shame. And that feeling of shame or the emotion of shame depends upon our appraisal of the situation and what we've been taught is right and wrong by our society and our subculture. And if you reappraise the situation later, you may feel more shame or remember more shame depending on which way you have reappraised the situation. So current appraisals of a situation or a past situation are a major cause of current emotions. But there's also research that shows that reappraisals also change memory of emotion. So it's possible to reappraise a situation in the past, perhaps 20 years ago, in which you did not feel distress at the time, but then you come to reappraise a situation as being a turning point or a major obstacle in your life. You re reappraise it in the present 20 years later, and then you come to misremember feeling more distress at the time than you actually did because we use our current appraisals to remember what emotion we felt. As I've shown in my research, you can also reappraise the goodness or the badness of a person. And that will change how you remember feeling about that person in the past and also how you feel about them right now in the present. So in my research, I kept it positive for participants for ethical reasons. And I showed that if you reappraise a parent in the present day, you can misremember how much love you felt towards them in childhood, as well as it changes your present feelings of love towards them. For example, when participants were randomly assigned to a condition in which they reappraise their mother in a downward direction, they came to misremember feeling less love than they actually did. And this was just in one lab session. And just imagine how much reappraisals can build up in many sessions in psychotherapy. So even at the time of the event, two people may appraise the situation differently. And even at that time, they may disagree on what the other person would be feeling. Now that difference in appraisal becomes even greater later on, decades later, where people could have reappraised, maybe both parties have reappraised the initial situation such that they disagree even more on the meaning of that initial situation. 
For example, if one person reappraised the other person as being a very bad person or having worse intentions than they actually did, then that will lead to changes in emotions or changes in memories of emotions that they had in the past. And this could come about if you hear misleading information about the person or unfair criticism of the person in the intervening years. Now, let me quickly discuss the research that has shown that reappraising a situation can lead to memory of emotions changing over time and current emotions changing as well. So in a longitudinal study, Levine in 1997 found that Ross Perot supporters who reappraised his behavior would misremember how they felt about his withdrawal from the presidential race months later. Similarly, Levine et al. 2001 found that reappraisals of the O.J. Simpson not guilty verdict led to misremembering the emotions that they felt earlier. In studies by Martin Safer and Linda Levine and others, they found that people misremember their pre-exam anxiety after they receive their grades later, which leads to a reappraisal. In my research, I've found that reappraising mothers leads to changes in current emotions and misremembering memories of emotions in childhood. So why do two people have such different memories of the emotions and the meaning of events many decades ago? The simple answer is that one, they may have appraised the events differently at the time, so they didn't understand how people felt about it at the time. And two, one or both of them may have reappraised the events since then, so there's an even greater shift in memories of emotion and current emotions and differences between the two people's understanding of the meaning of the event after many years. There have been some other findings that reinforce the ideas that emotions are not remembered very well. So research on how we remember major news events has shown that memories of emotions are not very well remembered compared to other types of memory. So for example, people tend to remember how they felt at the time of the Challenger space disaster, or how they felt right after the 9-11 New York attacks, worse than other aspects of their memories around that event, such as details, for example. I think there is something about emotions that are not well stored in memory. And when we try to recall them, we reconstruct the situation in our mind's eye in the present to recreate how we must have felt. So in situations like this, you have to look back at old evidence from the time to prevent the memory distortions from growing too great over time. For example, if you look, you can find old letters that say that someone really enjoyed a visit, and then two decades later, the same person might now be misremembering that they felt great distress during a visit, for example. So look for that evidence. That might be a sign of reappraisal, of the meaning, and of the emotions that they actually felt at the time. That area of research on emotions and memory of emotions, I think is the most relevant to today's question. But it's not the complete picture. So to complete the picture, I'm going to broaden the focus to memory in general and then to some more relevant research. The most important findings scientists have confirmed is that memory is not like a video recording. There are three stages to memory, the sensory stage, the working memory stage, and the long-term memory. And at every stage, there's massive amounts of information lost forever. If something is not attended to fully, for example, at the time in the scene, it is lost forever and is irretrievable. In other words, it doesn't get from sensory memory into working memory. And the small amount that does make it into long-term memory from working memory actually decays over time with a distinctive exponential decay curve. And to put it simply, we lose a lot of long-term memory immediately after the event. And then after a few days, the decay of the remaining memory trace continues, but at a slower rate of loss. Now, the reason long-term memory fades is likely the fading of patterns of the synapse storage in neural clusters in the cortex of the brain. So memories are stored in these synapses in these clusters. These networks are biological systems, and it's reasonable to expect that long-term potentiation between neurons will fade over time, and indeed it does. Biological psychology research in reconsolidation, which just means the retrieval of memory and then the solidifying of that memory again, reinforces this view. Memory traces in the brain fade a lot over time, and when they are reactivated, they are strengthened. The trouble is that these memories can be reconsolidated slightly differently each time they are remembered and then reconsolidated. 
False memories are also possible. False details that one party may misremember, which will confuse the other party involved. And this can happen to everyone, especially on events more than a decade old. That is because the episodic or visual aspects of the memory have faded a lot after many years, and the faint memory traces that are left are reconstructed using the imagination and the mind's eye to build up an image of what happened. So after many years, that remembering process becomes more and more like a decision, a decision based on very faint memory traces. The danger here is that you reconstruct the memory slightly incorrectly each time and the new memory trace becomes stronger. The research that has shown that misleading information can lead to false memories for details is called the misinformation effect. This effect has been replicated hundreds of times since it was discovered in the 1970s. It consists of three stages. Stage one is where you present the event to the participant. Stage two, which is then perhaps hours or days later, the researcher will sneakily implant false details into their questions for the original event. And then stage three is where you test the memory. And what you find is that those who were randomly assigned to receive the misinformation tend to remember more false details than those in the control group. That's called the misinformation effect. In a couple of the first misinformation effect studies in the 1970s, Loftus and colleagues made suggestions that led to one group of participants remembering a car crash being more severe than it actually was. And in another study, false details about seeing a stop sign were implanted versus a yield sign. Now, these findings have replicated for decades. In fact, the first time I tried the misinformation effect experiment, I found that those in the misinformation group tended to misremember where a thief had put a purse that they had stolen. Now, misleading information like this, given a long time after the original event, is one of the most powerful factors in distorting memories. This effect appears to replicate even in those with strong memories, with highly superior memory, in children, and in older adults too. In fact, there's no research to suggest that anyone is immune to this type of memory reconstruction. More recent research has shown that whole events can be misremembered as well, especially from timeframes of many, many years ago. Being lost in a mall was implanted in some participants in a study in the 1990s, and since then, vicious animal attacks, remembering committing a crime, spilling punch at a wedding, and so on, have been implanted into some participants when in fact that did not happen to them. In many of these studies, the researcher checked with family members just to check that the event did not happen. A mega-analysis analysis of all of these rich false memory studies found that about 30% of participants on average tended to fall for these false suggestions in each given study on average. Now that does not mean that 70% of the participants were immune, but that they did not distort their memories in that single suggestive study. If we all receive some information over our lifetime, I think everybody will inevitably incorporate some of it into memory. Now, guided imagery is a technique used in some therapies that can lead to memory distortions. Imagining an event vividly, one that did not actually happen, can inflate your confidence that it did happen later. This inflation in confidence is called imagination inflation. Now, the research finding in this area is that when you randomly assign individuals to get a guided imagery technique, their confidence that something implausible happened decades ago goes up compared to the control group. Motivation can also play a role in memory distortions. If you have a strong motivation to reappraise something or to remember something differently in a certain way, then that can lead to memory distortions too. People tend to remember things tinged by their motivations in the present. For example, in one study, people tended to misremember their grades in a positive direction, likely caused by a motivation to want to think of themselves of doing better in the past than they actually did. Other mechanisms have been shown to cause memory distortions too, such as age regression, hypnosis, and associations between concepts. In a complex case where two parties disagree over allegations from decades ago, other aspects of psychology may help understand why there are differences in framing the past events. 
For example, some recent research has shown that as something becomes rarer in an environment, our criteria becomes more sensitive. And follow-up research on that idea says that that is also true of how we label something as being traumatic or not. In one experiment, when participants were exposed only to sentences containing very mild stresses, they started to label middle-of-the-road stresses as being traumatic compared to those individuals who were exposed to more severe Via sentences. And the researcher went on to say that this may explain why we've seen an increase in reported trauma in countries that have seen a decrease in violence over the same time period. This may explain why in some countries we may reappraise a hug or holding hand or a kiss on the forehead as being traumatic, while in other violent cultures they may be reserving that label of trauma or abuse for violent assaults and so on. This relates to another recent idea in academia of concept creep. How concepts such as abuse or trauma tend to creep in their definition over time such that they start to encompass more and more phenomena. Out of this concept creep and the broadening of the concept of trauma, we see patterns such as higher PTSD diagnosis in countries with lower violence and lower PTSD diagnosis in some of the most violent countries in the world. In a recent dissertation at Harvard, Peyton Jones connected this to Bradley and Campbell's idea of the rise of victimhood culture in limited spaces in the United States, such as in college campuses and in the educated class. Victimhood culture involves the increased social rewards that can be gained in this culture for declaring oneself oppressed, victimized, or having a mental disorder. This reduction in stigma around victimization has a positive aspect, of course, to it, especially in cases of true victimization, but it also changes the dynamics of the social world where the social benefits may match or exceed the disadvantage of, of stating that one was a victim. If you look at this graph that Dr. Jones showed in his dissertation, it shows the reduction in stigma over time in red and the increase in social rewards. And uh, when they are in balance, there will be a minimum of false categorizations either way. If you move too much to the left of this graph, you risk falsely categorizing some real victims as not being victims. And if you go too much to the right on this graph, the danger is that the allure of social rewards become larger and that may result in someone who was not victimized getting classified incorrectly as being a victim of abuse. Another aspect of social psychology that might help people understand disagreements about behavior and the meaning from decades ago is to understand the phenomena of reappraising past norms with using today's norms. For example, if the accepted norms within a group decades ago were a certain set of behaviors and now today we reappraise that as being less wise and it was, you have to take that into account that those cultural changes may lead to some of the changes in emotion that we feel and memories of emotion that I was talking about earlier. And a final part of social psychology I want to quickly mention is research on motivated reasoning, which is the tendency to find arguments in favor of our conclusions that we want to believe to be stronger than arguments for conclusions that we do not want to believe. So if we have a strong monetary, political, or social motivation, we are an adept at only attending to confirming evidence, and we're very dismissive of any disconfirming evidence that somebody might bring up. This is related to research on confirmation bias in social psychology and cognitive psychology too. So there are a lot of cognitive and social factors at play here that answer the question of why two people might disagree about something that happened decades ago. The most important thing you should notice here is that both parties may genuinely believe what they are saying. In many cases, neither side is lying because we're talking about memory distortions. It is often the case that memories have changed or that appraisals of the meaning of the past events have changed. In conclusion, I want to repeat my main point. Appraisals of past events or of people can change over time and that in turn will cause a change in current emotion and in memories of those past emotions from many years ago. 